Our next session is Recovering from the Obama Flu. What is the prescription for health care? Please welcome Dale Bellis of Liberty HealthShare, Congressman Mike Burgess, Scott Flanders of eHealth, and Grace Marie Turner from the Galen Institute. Our panel is moderated by Philip Klein of the Washington Examiner. Well, I thank uh, those of you who uh, stayed here rather than uh, heading off to lunch. Um, we have a limited amount of time and a very big subject to tackle. Um, I think that it's a fair assumption that to those in this audience, uh, they believe that Obamacare is a disaster. And I feel as though with this panel, <laughs> we can talk about what comes next after uh, Obamacare. Should it be repealed. Um, so I want to start uh, with you, uh, Chairman Burgess. Uh, Representative Burgess is chairman of the Health Subcommittee of the Energy and Commerce, which is one of the committees that's tasked with coming up with a plan to repeal and replace Obamacare. Now, um, Chairman Burgess, we obviously, the core Republican message for since 2010 when Republicans ran to take over the Congress was about repealing and replacing Obamacare. And it seemed like going into this year there was uh, some, a lot of momentum toward following through on that promise. But now there's been a, a, a lot of fighting among Republicans. Republicans are coming under attacks. And just today we had the former Speaker of the House John Boehner say that he doesn't think repeal and replace is going to happen. Um, what do you say? Is this going to happen? Is repeal and replace going to happen? Yeah, it's going to happen. And let me just go through with you how, at least how I see this, this unfolding. A year ago, a little over a year ago now, December 2015, the House and the Senate both passed a bill under what are called reconciliation instructions in the Senate, it meant they only had to have 51 votes. And it passed the House, it passed the Senate. It went to the President's desk and was vetoed. Uh, the veto was sustained in the Senate, and so, okay, the end of that. But it demonstrated to me that if you got the right person in the White House, you could send that bill back down the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue, and you would repeal large pieces of the Affordable Care Act. Does it take all of it out? No, it does not, but it's a good start. So that is our starting point this year. We are starting with reconciliation because, again, you only have to have 51 votes over in the Senate. The, the predicate bill will be the one that passed uh, in December of 2015. So what does it do? It takes away the penalties for the individual mandate and the employer mandate. It takes out a lot of the Obamacare taxes. It does not take kids off their parents' insurance until age 26. That was not part of the reconciliation bill last time. It won't be part of the reconciliation bill this time. Pre-existing conditions actually unchanged under the reconciliation instructions. It does do away with the Medicaid expansion and we are in the process of trying to figure out right now how to minimize the disruption in expansion states but still achieve the goal and how not to punish non-expansion states. Important to me because I'm from a non-expansion state. I spent the month of December talking to my counterparts in the House and Senate in the Texas House and Texas Senate. I, my, my premise to them was, I want to go to Washington and be for what you're for. I want you to tell me, is it a block grant? Is it a per capita cap? What is it you want to see going forward? And I'll go up there and fight for that for you. These are the kind of the big pieces that are in, in play right now. Uh, some of the things that people want to see gone will not be gone under reconciliation. We actually don't touch the essential health benefits. There is another part of this that will happen at the agency that the new Secretary of Health and Human Services, who I spent an hour with this morning, there is a great deal that can be done on the regulatory side. There are more insurance reforms that can be done down the road, but that is down the road. The first step is reconciliation, and we will get it done. Okay. How soon? 
we will get it done. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Look, okay, let me just say yeah. this. The president is coming to talk to a joint session of the House next week, next Tuesday. Um, I would like for him to say very directly to us, to my leadership in the House, Republicans and Democrats, that this is your job. I want you to get it done. Simple as that. Now, if I could get you to sort of respond to some of the, the criticism that's been coming both from the right and the left toward the Republican approach uh, so th thus far and to some of the outlines that have been uh, come out about the plan. So basically, on the right, you have a fear that what we're going to see is repeal and name only, that, that Republicans are going to say they repealed Obamacare, but the replacement is going to keep a lot of it intact, and maybe there'll be more health savings accounts and some tweaks to Medicaid here and there, but it won't really be a full, true repeal. W what do you say to those critics? Well, the structure under which we have to work to get the... We only have 52 Republican senators. I wish we had 60 like the Democrats did when they passed this dog. They passed it under regular order, but we don't have 60 votes. We have 51. So when the Democrats passed it with 60 votes, they then lost a vote and had to come in and do the cleanup with reconciliation. Reconciliation was sort of the end act of getting Obamacare across the finish line. It will be the opening salvo, it will be the opening act for us taking Obamacare out. The, the, the issues that you describe, yes, they are, they are of concern to me. Look, when people say, what would you do if you ran the zoo? And I have, have said for years, if I could just get rid of the individual mandate, that is the most coercive, unpleasant aspect of the Affordable Care Act. If I could get rid of the individual mandate, day one, take my hand off the Bible, get that out of there, I'd do it. Because suddenly you move from something where it's coercing the citizens of the United States to enter into a behavior, uh, you're going back into a market-based system. I think that is the central, most essential thing that must happen. Uh, yes, it happens under reconciliation, almost. So I'll take that. Now, obviously, the criticism that Republicans are going to come under already from the left, and certainly when they unveil a bill, is it's going to say, look, this is going to cover a lot fewer people. It doesn't have as generous subsidies. The insurance isn't as comprehensive. And Republicans are going to need to be able to respond to those uh, that onslaught of attacks and to protests that we're already seeing it at town hall meetings. What, what, what do you say, how would you respond to, to those criticisms? Well, first off, we're not going to send an IRS agent out to chase you down and make you buy health insurance. So if the numbers drop, I would say that's a good thing because we've restored personal liberty in this country, and I'm always for that. <laughs> the Congressional Budget Office is always going to come up with figures, and they'll be the subject of some question and some debate. But, uh, and I think others on the panel have a better handle on these numbers than I do. There are a lot of people right now that get an exemption from the individual mandate, so they're not doing it. They're not doing what the Affordable Care Act said they had to do. And there are other people who just say, I won't get insurance, find me. And that is actually occurring at, at the present time as well. So those people are outside. They're certainly not covered under the, uh, the aegis of the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, uh, I just, if you don't get rid of the individual mandate, if you don't get IRS agents chasing you down, if you don't stop IRS agents from chasing you down, forcing you to sign this up for this insurance, then you don't really change anything. That is the central thing, my opinion, that has to change. Okay, um, if we can move on. Um, Grace Marie, uh, who's president of the Galen Institute, has been working for decades with uh, Republicans to promote market-based alternatives to government health care. And um, I wanted to get you, because a lot of times when we have this discussion, uh, we get into sort of buzzwords where people who are in healthcare policy on the, the right often say, we want to empower the consumer, we want patient-centered care. Could you sort of explain what the vision would be for a free market healthcare system? Phil, it's really a devolution of power. It's giving power to individuals, to families, to doctors, and to states. States are a much better manager 
of the health insurance markets and the federal government. We've seen the wreckage of Obamacare and giving the states more power to, to give people more choices of coverage, I think is really, really crucial. One of the things that this law, this legislation that's being developed, I agree with you, Dr. Burgess, and this is gonna pass, and, and we heard, we heard Rince Priebus and, and, and Steve Bannon saying, the president delivers on his promises, and what's his number one promise? Repeal and replace Obamacare. But it is repeal and replace. And one of the lies of the left has been Republicans have no ideas. The House of Representatives worked almost all of last year refining plans from the different committee chairs, from senators that have been offered conservative think tanks, to come up with a consensus plan. That's the basis for the legislation that's being developed now. It enhances self savings accounts. It provides protection for people who have pre-existing conditions. It gives states more resources to help people who can't afford their coverage. It would reform Medicaid, which is a disaster of a program, a ghetto of a program. But the most important thing, I think, to, to again reiterate what Dr. Burgess said, we're not going to get everything we want in this first bill. This is the platform to begin once in a generation reform. We can build on that later, but Senator Schumer wants nothing more than to see this effort fail because they know Obamacare is failing and they want to blame somebody else after four election cycles when they've been pummeled by, on Obamacare. If it fails, if this legislation fails, the failure of Obamacare is going to increasingly be something that people blame Republicans for. So you may not like everything in this bill, but think of it as a down payment on really getting to the right kind of reform that we can pass maybe with Democrat support through regular order, but the process we have to go through doesn't allow you to get to everything in, in Obamacare. It has to be directly related to taxing or spending. So there will be, we have to do this, we have to get this out of here to, to be able to deliver on the repeal with replace pledge to the American people and to then begin the process of truly returning to a health sector that can be America's greatest health sector again. Now, I mean, one of the things that I've written about a lot is that I think that the debate among, within Republicans, I mean, it's, it's often been joked that it's not that Republicans don't have a plan, it's that they have far too many. And one of, I always say that everything sort of comes to this philosophical difference, which is sort of how, how much government intervention is somebody comfortable with to try to ensure broad coverage, and how much is do you care about coverage versus cost or something like that? And I think that policy-wise, this is often turned into a debate, manifested itself, I should say, in this debate over should we give people tax credits to purchase insurance or should they be given deductions? And it, it kind of seems like an esoteric debate, but it's actually about what role you want for government because tax credits are the equivalent of subsidies effectively. It's, it requires more government spending. Deductions are a tax, a tax cut effectively. Uh, however, if you have somebody who's low income who has a low tax burden against which to deduct, the deduction doesn't do much for them, so then you're not expanding coverage as much. So ultimately, this fight among Republicans and conservatives comes down to this underlying philosophical disagreement. So could you talk about that sort of debate within the Republicans? Well, I, I think it's really what would we want if we were starting with the right kind of policy for the health sector? We are not starting there. We're starting with Obamacare. We're starting with, you know, some number of millions of people, probably not as many as 20, but 20 million people, let's say, relying on Obamacare. So you have to build, you have to create a lifeboat for them. And using structures that provide the kind of resources that people need who don't have means to purchase health insurance on their own so they can continue coverage. The last thing we want is for Republicans to be blamed for millions of people losing their coverage again. So they have to have this light bulb. It's very likely to be refundable tax credit. Thank you. And at the same time, you've got to build a bridge for help for the future so that you've got this lifeboat out there while you're creating the bridge for a better system that gives people choices of the kind of coverage that they want and that they can afford. And it's very likely to be refundable tax credits. I don't know. But by the way, when you hear these CBO scores, 
the CBO has gotten it very, very wrong with Obamacare. Yeah. So we should take them with very much a grain of salt. If I can get Scott uh, involved here. Uh, Scott serves as CEO of eHealth Insurance, which is a website that before Obamacare existed allowed people to go on and compare among different plans and, and purchase insurance online. Um, if you could talk a bit about the industry perspective, because this is, as we've seen, a big factor in all of this. Uh, insurers are losing money under Obamacare. A lot of them are leaving or contemplating leaving. And could you talk to that, but also to the critique that some of the uncertainty about what Republicans are going to do is making maybe creating more problems for insurers than it's alleviating? Yeah, let's start with the fact that we don't have the luxury of time. Uh, Obamacare is already repealing in and of itself. It's disappearing because insurers have fled the market. They've lost billions of dollars. I don't represent the insurance companies. We're neutral. We're consumer centric but they are who pay us commissions for enrolling people in health care. And they're leaving because they can't make money. There's way too much fraud in the system. And it's until we fix the system, and it needs to be an ambitious fix. It can't just be a partial fix. We have to go after the whole loaf here. We have to go after it now. Consumers are leaving. They can't afford it. You know, the, the left talk about the 20 million people. Well, that number is drastically exaggerated. People sign up, they get the first premium, and they, they can't pay it. It's $1,000 for a family. Uh, middle class families don't have that kind of cash. And so they enroll, and then they disenroll. But insurers have to keep covering them for three months. And then the next year, they can enroll again and not have to make the back payment. So insurers are losing billions and billions of dollars here in this system. It's not working for young people. The target was to enroll 40% of Obamacare uh, uh, enrollees as millennials. The actual numbers this past year were 22% were millennials. Well, why? Because it's a one-size-fits-all, way too expensive program, and millennials are opting out. I don't think the mandate matters at all. Uh, only 4% of our customers say the mandate had any impact at all on them enrolling in health care. Uh, no, Dale, uh, you spoke earlier today about uh, Liberty HealthShare and about the idea of pooling risk for people who don't want to have health insurance and want to share medical costs. Um, but that sort of raises questions about how broadly applicable is that toward the, the overall health insurance system, where you have hundreds of millions of people trying to get insurance. Um, could you talk to that? Uh, it is our interest that we really present a uh, option for the consumer to make those choices. Uh, our motivation is to just merely have the freedom and opportunity to continue uh, our movement of sharing medical bills uh, uh, free from not only government involvement, but free from insurance. Uh, and just simply permit an open marketplace uh, so that our option continues as well as many others. But how do you get away from, I mean, every insurance, every insurer deals with the problem that's adverse selection, right? Mm -hmm. That people, uh, the, the, the fear that you're only gonna get the sickest people to, to, right. to gain coverage and, and sign up and then uh, you're going to have to cover those people, but you won't have younger and healthier people to defray the cost. In a system such as yours, uh, how does that work? How do you basically prevent only sicker people with higher medical costs from saying, yeah, I want to share my medical cost? The, the vast majority of pre-existing conditions presented to Liberty HealthShare uh, are those conditions particularly responsive to lifestyle change. And so we welcome those pre-existing conditions, high blood pressure, heart disease, uh, type 2 diabetes, certainly uh, obesity, smoking. Uh, those are conditions that we welcome, but we enroll them in our health track program, which means we assign them a health coach. They set out their own uh, definable treatment plan. Uh, and uh, with the support and guidance of a health coach, reach those objectives uh, once those uh, are accomplished. 
So they're reducing uh, not only the, their costs through lifestyle changes and support, diet, exercise, et cetera, uh, but they're taking the responsibility for the costs associated uh, with those particularly responsive uh, to lifestyle. Other conditions which are a minuscule percentage uh, of pre-existings, we don't share in in the first year, but the second, third, and fourth years we do, and they're no longer pre-existing with us. Now, if I could get the rest of the panel to weigh in on this, on the issue of pre-existing conditions, because I'd say that whenever you're in discussions with somebody who's skeptical of free market alternatives, it's usually one of the first questions is, well, what about people with pre-existing conditions? Wouldn't insurers in a free market have every reason to say, well, they're too costly, so we don't want to insure them. It's a money-losing endeavor. Do you want to Yeah, start let's be, be sure of what we're talking about, because we are talking about people in the individual market. In the large group market, the employer-sponsored market, where most Americans get their health insurance, once you go through the probationary period of employment, you're covered. You have the benefit. It is pre-existing conditions exist in the individual market as an, as an exclusionary device that medical underwriting created. But what are the real numbers? And you know, when, when the Affordable Care Act was up before the Supreme Court in 2012, uh, I, I struggled with what do we need to do to be, because I thought it was going away, right? How could they possibly say this is constitutional? We're forcing you to buy it, so we're going to regulate it under the Commerce Clause. That's crazy. No one's going to think like that. Well, I was wrong. But I thought, what are the main things that people are going to be concerned about? Kids on 20 till 26, donut hole in Medicare, and pre-existing. Well, the insurance company said kids to 26 is a good marketing strategy. We're going to keep that. So good. That problem solved. The donut hole, I thought, was a problem that pharma created for themselves down at the White House when Obamacare was written, so that's their problem. But the pre-existing conditions. There was a federal pre-existing pool that was created for the first time in the Affordable Care Act. It had not existed prior. So how many people in that pre-existing pool that was created under the Affordable Care Act, how many people are we going to have to deal with? It was 65,000. 65,000. Tell me we can't solve a problem for 65,000 people. Why do we have to make everybody else's life miserable while we're trying to solve a problem for 65,000 people? Of course we can. But that approach was never taken, and that was, the you know one, to me, one of the big failings. And the Democrats pushed pre-existing conditions. There's 125 million people out there with pre-existing conditions. No, the actual numbers are quite small, and it is a small segment of the population. It's an important segment. It's a sympathetic segment. We can take care of that with, with flexibility that states can use, with, with uh, the, the grants to states for, the, for flexible uh, risk pools. There are a number of things that could be done. We didn't have to do what Obama did. And the, the real issue, Phil, is that people need continuous coverage protection. They need to have insurance. Pre-existing conditions are a problem when you're trying to buy into an insurance market. We need to have an open season, when, or an open enrollment period, when people can buy in. And as long as they keep that, that insurance, they can be continuously protected from premium spikes. They can't just jump in and out of the market, as Scott said, as they are doing now. So pre-existing conditions is really a temporary problem. If you have a system in which people want to buy health insurance because it meets their needs and they can afford it. That's not the case with Obamacare and as a result you've got this 40,000 page mass of regulations to try to pin everybody in. No, our view is give people options and choices with, through, that they can purchase through eHealth, that they can get through Liberty Health, just countless other options for coverage if you had real market forces working so that people are able to get and keep coverage. It's not rocket science. And if I can use the words exciting and health policy together in a sentence, uh, <laughs> the most exciting day in health policy for me was the day before inauguration. The governors were in town. I have never seen so much energy and enthusiasm. Oh, okay. The governors brought to these round tables, one on the Senate side, one on the House side. They want to be involved in these problems. They feel that they were left out when this stuff was created eight yeah. years ago. They are anxious to participate in our solutions. Okay, and we're uh, about to have to wrap up, but I just want to yes or no question quickly. By next CPAC, will Obamacare be repealed and replaced? And we could. Each one could take that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 
<laughs> yes. Yes. Yes, followed by an if, the reconciliation. <laughs> well, the reconciliation will obviously will pass before uh, and, and be signed by the president sometime in the very near time horizon. What happens on the regulatory front? What happens on the, on the reconstruction of the insurance issues under regular order? That's all going to take some time. Could we still be talking about it next CPAC? Sure, we could be. That, that's full employment for me. But Phil, don't, don't underestimate the benefit of the executive order that President Trump signed. There's a lot that can be done on the regulatory front here to make this a much more consumer-friendly and insurer-friendly system. Okay, well, thank you, everyone, and thank you for those uh, who listened. Yes, thank you.